My name is Paulo Blickstein, and I'm a professor at Columbia University in New York City in the United States. And in this video, we'll introduce you to the idea of open schooling, uh, explain how open schooling evolved, and explore the multiple dimensions of open schooling and how it can be applied in your community or region. So let's start with some history. Uh, once upon a time, when schools were not around in the old days, uh, you know, kids were taught at home by their families. It was very different. But still, in order to survive, every generation have found a way to pass on accumulated knowledge, accumulated skills, values, traditions uh, to the next generation. So, you know, a long time ago, when uh, unfortunately education was very, and life in general was very gendered, uh, most boys and mostly only boys were taught um, by their fathers uh, a trade. And, or they would apprentice in a workshop uh, and learn a trade. So this was a, a system called uh, apprenticeships. So in this system, uh, to train a new generation of practitioners of a train or a profession, you would do it on the job. So, you know, in, in the old days, kids were exposed to different things, different ways of doing things, different professions, different trades. And it didn't all happen through a, for, a process of formal schooling. Uh, you know, they used to learn what they needed to know from their families, from their environments, from uh, their regions, their communities. And uh, not education was not so, so concentrated, so focused uh, in schools. Uh, over time, uh, nevertheless, you know, with population growth and the growth of cities and, and uh, you know, all the historical changes that we've had uh, in the last um, two, three centuries, uh, rather than just the family being uh, individually responsible for education, uh, people soon figured that, uh, you know, it would be more efficient or it would be uh, more efficient for certain groups of people who have, uh, to have a small group of adults to teach a much larger group of children and then maybe put them in a room. And then, uh, as you can guess, you know, the concept of schooling was born. So ancient schools were not like the schools of today. Uh, the earliest forms of schools uh, focused on teaching very specific practical skills or passing along religious uh, values and ideas rather than teaching specific subject areas like today, uh, such as math or uh, science and things like that. Um, you know, a few hundred years ago, and uh, only really the sons of kings and the sons of very rich uh, uh, professionals and royalty would have uh, access to schools, uh, to, you know, learning mathematics, learning to read and write, and, and things like that. This model fortunately evolved and changed uh, based on, you know, lots of historical movements that we've seen in the last uh, few centuries. Uh, but physically, the schoolhouse of, uh, you know, the, the old times is still very similar to the schools of today. So schools were filled with multiple classrooms and students were separated by grade, by class, by ability. And and that's a little bit how schools are today as well. So this model of schooling in which you segregate kids by age, when, in which you put them in a building uh, and, and separate them from the rest of society, uh, you know, seemed like a good idea, but it soon became a source of lots of problems. People were realizing that there was a big gap between schools and the world outside, between what schools were training uh, students to do and the needs uh, of the workforce, the needs of society, uh, and even th uh, what they needed to be, uh, you know, citizens, not just like workers, but citizens that could actually uh, take charge of their lives, fight for their rights, etc. And also there are lots of differences between the way schools ended up organizing uh, uh, themselves and you know the needs of the outside world. For example, when you work with people, normally you collaborate a lot. Normally you talk to people, 
normally you exchange ideas uh, you know you rarely have to memorize lots of stuff and work individually so uh, schools ended up becoming very individualistic institutions because when you have a test you cannot talk to your uh, friends you cannot look at books you cannot look at everything you have to memorize everything and so schools started to become a, sort of a weird uh, kind of model because it started to look more and more uh, different than what people needed and what people did outside so open schooling is a way to go back to the way uh, uh, learning was before formal kind of industrial age school was invented Open schooling is a broad term that describes uh, learning which is open in terms of timing, in terms of location, in, in, in terms of teaching roles, methods, and, and many other factors uh, related to learning. In other words, uh, it's where uh, school becomes an agent of community well-being uh, and where families and companies and organizations become real partners in school life and in the learning journey, journey of the students. Many schools already actually do this kind of uh, work. They, they do this kind of approach. And it's a program where you know, learners are empowered to create their own culturally relevant learning experiences and teachers, instead of being given you know, standardized things to teach, they're giving new ways to connect to students uh, to a range of different topics and, and, and their environments, their surroundings, the, their communities, for example, like I, you know, topics like food waste or pollution or healthy eating. You know, those are things that you normally don't see in schools, but um, that often uh, open schooling projects are dealing with because they are relevant and important to the kids. The open schooling initiative is grounded in a framework that has been tested and researched with many, many students, many, many users all around the world. And in order to design an open schooling model, we recognized uh, and we identified six dimensions that can inform the design of an open schooling program. Uh, the first of those dimensions are the components. So what components do you want to include? Uh, what tangible elements uh, make up this open schooling project and will enable it to happen. So, for example, uh, downloadable resources, visit to experts in schools, uh, field trips, uh, and, and many other kinds of things. The second point is the quality. So what quality you want to include, uh, what qualities you want to include in the program. Uh, you know, the features and the benefits of open schooling uh, what, which ones you want to deliver? For example, do you want uh, one of these qualities to be real life relevance? Do you want one of these qualities to be agency, to be equity, access, inclusion, social connection, uh, creating networks, uh, creating tangible physical outputs, uh, change of atmosphere, you know, take kids to a different place, uh, or development of teachers, like you want teachers to uh, make this a professional development activity for them as well. Another point that you know, I commented already a little bit is uh, the who or the role. So who will be involved and, and what roles will those people play? So the identities and the job titles of everyone that will be involved in the, in, in the students' learning experiences can be very diverse. For example, uh, people can provide expertise. They can you know, sometimes be more like teachers. Sometimes they can find the locations, the facilities that kids will use for the open school, uh, schooling activity. Sometimes they can make connections, so they can connect the kids with experts. So, uh, you know, the roles and, and the people that will participate, are, that's a very important, uh, very important choice. They, they can have a, vari a variety of uh, uh, functions in the activity. The other important uh, uh, component is the location. What's the ideal location? Where you want to be? Uh, you know, is the project uh, inside the school, outside the school, uh, outside of the school, uh, in a community center, uh, in a forest or a park, or the beach, or in a market, etc. So there are many, many possibilities. 
And, and another important component is the timing. So what's the ideal time? What's the ideal duration of your open schooling program? Uh, it's really important to budget time accordingly to what you want to do. If you want to do something that goes very deep, that requires a lot of time to collect data, to talk to experts, to analyze the data, you know, you want to make sure you have time to do all of that. Uh, so, you know, it's important to capture detail about the scheduling, uh, you know, in the school day and outside of the school day, and whether the project is a short-term experience or a long-term experience. Uh, sometimes, you know, it could be a day-long experience, sometimes it could be several weeks. So it's really important to figure that out before when you're designing the activity. Uh, another component is the approach. So what is the approach that you're going to uh, um, uh, pick for your, uh, for your activity? Uh, what kind of providers uh, uh, you, you're gonna need? Is it uh, a kind of more do-it-yourself type of approach uh, or you know, some other combination? So uh, those are six, uh, six components that are really important to take into consideration. And just to summarize, uh, this framework that I just described has been built by teachers for other teachers to help design and plan an open schooling program that will be implemented within uh, within the curriculum and not replacing the curriculum, not replacing what you do in schools. And throughout this process, we work with teachers all across Europe to understand their needs and to design a really supportive framework to implement open schooling within their schools. And after implementing um, these open schooling activities in, in, in schools all over the continent, we received a lot of feedback uh, very positive feedback from teachers because they recognize that sometimes they they really needed to get outside of traditional schooling, uh, sometimes outside of the building, outside of the curriculum, and do open schooling activities uh, related to what they were doing in schools, but in other environments with other approaches, with other timings, uh, with other kinds of connections to the community. So. We hope that you will also be able to uh, use the open schooling framework to design activities for your students, for your communities, and for your schools. Mm -hmm.